Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with James Manika, the Chairman of the McKinsey Global Institute and a member, a commissioner on the Commission on Global Economic Transformation that is supported by INET. James, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Rob. Hope you're well wherever you are. Uh, sitting in New York City, where, how would I say, population density is much greater than I wish it were at the moment, though I enjoy living here normally. And you're in San Francisco? Uh, I'm in San Francisco. I've been sheltered in place for the last uh, two and a half months. Uh -huh. I see. Well, we have uh, here on the 14th of May been exploring changing our living conditions, changing how we see the world and uh, what's been unmasked, what's changing in the world of ideas. McKinsey Global Institute's done an awful lot of interesting work related to automation, machine learning, technological change. And recent work I remember you did with uh, our co-chairman and mutual friend, Mike Spence, related to the change of the social contract. How, how is it that the pandemic illuminates the kind of challenges that you've been exploring and in what ways does it change things? Well, I think we find ourselves at an extraordinary moment, Rob, uh, and some of the work we've done on the social contract is brought in, into even sharper relief uh, in this moment. Uh, maybe I can describe what we've been looking at in the sense of, as we've looked at the social contract. Uh, we were quite interested to see how the social contract has changed in the 20 years since the start of the 21st century. And in this case, we're focused primarily on the impact on individuals and individuals in the sense of how they involve themselves and participate in the economy. So think of this as individuals as workers, individuals as consumers and households, and individuals as savers. And we're trying to chart the course as to how that has evolved over the last 20 years. And, and the, that has been quite striking because for the most part, while a lot of wonderful things have happened, uh, such as growth and employment and so forth, there have also been some real challenges and changes in the way the social contract works. Uh, and those are all topics we can go into. But many of the challenges that we've seen now have been brought into very sharp relief because a lot of the challenges for individuals have had to do with the fragility of work uh, and incomes and inequality. They've had to do with the fact that the uh, cost of basics, uh, such as education and health care, uh, have become have skyrocketed in terms of their cost and accessibility. And they've also been challenging from the point of view of individuals as savers. Now, if you think about all those challenges I've just described, uh, they've been brought into very sharp relief in this moment where we're facing both a public health crisis and, uh, in many cases, e economies that are very challenged and, in some cases, uh, in almost near depression-like collapse, uh, depending on how things go. So this has put even greater stresses on individuals in the 21st century. And the nature of the social contract has actually been changed quite significantly. And perhaps to go deeper into exactly what is it about the social contract that's changed in the last 20 years. Um, so take the case of individuals as workers, for example. Uh, this is a story of uh, some enormous gains and some real challenges. Uh, so in the 22 countries that we looked at, mostly in the advanced economies, uh, something like, uh, you know, we've expanded employment dramatically, something like 45 million more working age people uh, gained employment by, uh, gained employment by 2018 versus 2000. So the growth of jobs was actually quite astounding, despite the fact that there was a big recession in the middle of that period. And of those roughly 45 million additional jobs, uh, close to 30, 30 million of them were actually for women. So these are enormous gains. But the challenges for individuals as workers have, have had to do with the fact that work feels as a lot more fragile. Most of those job gains that have occurred have actually been in either part-time or independent work or even the so-called gig economy. Income fragility has actually gone up. 
uh, and as well as worker safety nets have also been decreased. So this is a case of gains in terms of employment, but also more fragile employment. If you take the case of individuals as consumers, uh, this is also a tale of two halves. Uh, so when individuals have been consuming products like, uh, you know, uh, white good products, uh, electronics, uh, automobiles, uh, a lot of these discretionary spend uh, uh, categories, those have actually become much, much, much cheaper, thanks mostly to globalization, global competition, and you know, instances when those products are uh, competed for globally. However, even as those things have come down in, in cost quite dramatically, a few other categories have gone up in cost astronomically. And these include the cost of education, the cost of housing, and the cost of healthcare. And the degree to which these have gone up depends on which of the 22 advanced economies uh, we're talking about. But some of the largest increases in costs for those basics, like healthcare and education and housing, have actually been in some of the most advanced economies, like the United States and the United Kingdom, for example. So this is a case where, in one sense, globalization delivered, uh, but in another sense, some of these other categories went up astronomically. That's been the tale of uh, individuals as, as, as consumers and households. Uh, and then when you look at individuals as savers, uh, while many more saving uh, 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 vehicles and categories have become available, most people have not been able to participate in those. So if you step back and look across what has happened to individuals in the 21st century as regards to social contract, there have been some gains, but also enormous challenges. Now, you fast forward that to this COVID moment we find ourselves in at a time when uh, many more uh, workers have become vulnerable because of either they've been furloughed, uh, laid off, or uh, experiencing reduced working hours, uh, partly because of the public health crisis, but also partly because they work in sectors that have been adversely impacted by the virus, whether it's uh, we're talking about retail workers uh, or workers in hospitality, uh, and workers who are involved in many small businesses uh, that uh, we've had to shut down. And we estimate, for example, that in the, in the U.S., for example, as many as a third of the workers in the United States, which is about 57 million workers, are actually vulnerable, where vulnerability here refers to either they've been laid off, furloughed, or experiencing reduced hours. So this puts the kind of the social contract and these challenges in very sharp uh, relief. Uh, and it's an interesting moment that we find ourselves in, and uh, which may cause us to actually rethink how the system works uh, in terms of either safety nets or uh, the kind of way in which our modern capitalism works in how, in how far institutions, and including the government, support uh, individuals and workers in moments like this. Yeah, I've seen even uh, people like Mark Cuban on uh, on LinkedIn, I think it was yesterday, talking about we've got to change the model now of what comes first in terms of priorities and protections. And uh, he was going on with a, an interviewer and, and kind of alluded to the notion that the stock market is doing better than well over half the economy and the Washington based bailout plans. And this is my term, not his are kind of like the mother of all moral hazards where they're taking care of big, strong, politically powerful firms where an awful lot of people who are very vulnerable are fending for themselves and the equity markets reflect that support. But it, uh, I guess it's an open question whether it will diffuse into the kind of channels and into the structures that uh, you've been, how do I say, illuminating at McKinsey Global Institute. Your recent paper on lives and livelihoods uh, assessing the near-term impact of COVID-19 is something I'll put on the website as a link in conjunction with this podcast. But I found it, I found it quite striking 
And I guess I guess James said in a kind of do-over fantasy experiment. If you were appointed at the White House to structure the bailout, the assistance, would you have done things markedly different than what you've seen unfold in Washington? Uh I don't know if they'd be markedly different, different because in some ways uh, this is complicated uh, all the way around, Rob, in the following sense. I mean, I think, you know, stimulus and bailouts, uh, you know, our, our collective experience with those have been in, a, in so if you take 2008 as, as, a, as kind of a comparative point, uh, at that time, stimula, stimulus and bailouts uh, were effective. Uh, but they didn't, partly because we didn't face a situation where we also had a public health crisis at the same time, because the complication of a economic economy in collapse and a public health crisis uh, is a new experience for us in the following way. Uh, stimulus works when you can put money in people's hands and bail out companies, but on the presumption that people can still go to work and people can still go out and consume things. Uh, and so, therefore, the economy comes back. We know that with this current circumstance, uh, workers can't just go back to work, uh, partly because of the public health crisis, uh, because there's shutdowns and lockdowns, and appropriately so in many cases, to protect the health of workers. And at the same time, even if we put money in the hands of consumers and households, while well, that'll obviously help a lot for people who've lost their jobs, but it still doesn't make it possible for people to more fully go out and participate in the economy. So stimulus is always going to have a mixed effectiveness uh, in this current environment because of the public health crisis. Uh, at the same time, we still need, do need stimulus because a lot of those businesses and companies are, are unable to continue providing products and services. Uh, I think it would have been wonderful to perhaps encourage more of that stimulus to have gone to uh, individuals, low-income individuals, and also to small and medium-sized businesses, even more than it did perhaps, partly because those are some of the most uh, challenged uh, groups, both as individuals and as businesses in our economy. I'm struck by the fact that, uh, Rob, as I said earlier, of the roughly th a third of the workers who are vulnerable uh, because of shutdowns and other things, uh, as many as 80% of them are low-income workers, meaning they earn less than $40,000 a year. So the disproportionate impact on uh, low-income workers, who tend to be the most vulnerable in our system, uh, is very, very high. Uh, many of them tend to be workers who don't have uh, you know, bachelor's degrees, uh, who work in very exposed environments, uh, who cannot afford to or not able to work remotely, uh, like perhaps some of us can. Uh, so I would have tried to support those individuals uh, and the businesses and companies where they participate and work even more, perhaps. You've talked about uh, in earlier work that when I've been in your office and, and work with the OECD and others, the notion of superstar firms and I guess uh, most of what I see in the press has to do with inequality of individuals relative to wealthy individuals or well relative to large corporations. But it seems to me that there, the relationship between the superstar firm and every other is another form of, of inequality. And how, how is that manifest? How is that playing out? Uh, as the pandemic, as you said, moves through society, affecting both supply and demand. Yeah, we, we've been quite fascinated by this idea of the superstar effect. And by the way, the superstar effect, we think actually operates at multiple levels. So it operates at the level of individuals, which we typically see as inequality. But we see it also for firms, uh, for sectors and even cities. But let me talk about uh, for firms and companies. We, uh, a couple of years ago, we, we started this project where we actually tried to look at all the large, all the companies in the world uh, that have more than a billion dollars in revenue, and there's quite a lot of them. And what's striking is that if you compare 
how those companies have done and can you compare today versus, say, 20 years ago, uh, we found that the top 10%, you could call those the superstar firms uh, in that set, uh, we're now capturing close to 80% of the profits available to all those firms. Uh, that's actually quite a lot of uh, concentration. If you look at the top 1% of those firms, uh, they were now capturing about 38% of all the profits available to those firms, and which is quite striking, as you said, in terms of the concentration of that. But the other things that were also interesting about that group, the superstar group, is that, first of all, they come actually from a diverse set of sectors. They're not all just technology companies, although many of them are. Some of them are uh, pharmaceutical companies. Some of them are banks. Uh, but it's a, it's a relatively diverse group. They, in the last 20 years, the group has changed from being predominantly uh, American and European to now being dominated by American and Chinese firms. What's also interesting about the, the superstar group of firms is that it's actually very competitive at the top, actually. Uh, so we found that of the top of the top 10% of firms, something like half of them fell out of out of the superstar category every business cycle. And of the ones that fell out of that group uh, at the top, uh, close to 40% of them actually fell all the way to the bottom. So in other words, it's actually quite competitive at the top. And these are firms that are, tend to be more globalized tend to make use of technology uh, and tend to, you know, quite frankly, be growing quite fast. Now, if you translate that now to the COVID moment, you know, you can already see that uh, many of those firms are actually seeing perhaps even more accelerated growth, partly benefiting from the highly digital nature for, or for many of them. We know that, for example, some of the trends that have been accelerated in this moment are mostly digital trends. So we were already on this path towards e more and more e-commerce. Well, that's been one of the trends that's been accelerated. We were on this path of seeing more delivery of products and services through digital means uh, and remote delivery and so forth. So we're seeing more of that. Uh, we're already seeing the trends where uh, you know automation was increasing. Well, in, in a case where people are concerned about public health and so forth, I think there's also been a slightly growing appetite to actually uh, automate more, and we'll see how that plays out. So it's quite possible that these superstar effects will uh, will get even uh, more accelerated. There's one area, though, where we might actually see a slight undoing, perhaps, of these superstar effects. Uh, this is with regards to superstars when it comes to cities. Uh, we had observed that at least over the last 20, 30 years, um, there were increasingly these superstar cities that were capturing a uh, large disproportionate share of the global GDP or even the GDP of their own countries. Uh, so you can think of a London or you can think of a Moscow, you can think of a Cairo, for example, in the context of their own countries. But one of the things that's going to be interesting about these superstar cities is that many of them relied on what you might call densification or agglomeration, uh, people living in very high dense environments. And I think as, as concerns about public health and safety increase, we may actually see perhaps a de-densification uh, of most things, uh, particularly in a world in which there continues to be concerns about public health and safety, in a world in which uh, we may get a little bit more comfortable with remote work uh, uh, and we may get a little bit more comfortable with uh, delivered services uh, wherever we are, we may actually see an interesting de-densification. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how all these uh, you know, trends evolve over the next uh, few years, even after the COVID uh, challenges and crisis have uh, hopefully gone away. I'm uh, interested, I recall uh, through the commission, you and Mike Spence and I uh, were together in the Presidio about a year about a year ago, and uh, I remember uh, John Mallory from MIT was talking about cybersecurity and competition, and many people have been uh, what you might call had sort of like Orwellian or foreboding scenarios where they 
saw centralization under technology. They saw, uh, because of increasing returns, extreme monopolies, extremely concentrated political power on the horizon. And there was, there was just, after a kind of enthusiasm for entrepreneurship and innovation, it was almost like a dark cloud came over the technology sector. Now I see, I won't say the clouds have all dissipated, but I see kind of two schools. One, uh, a guest I had on last week, Naomi Klein, talks about the Screen New Deal and the extreme centralization and destruction of democratic privacy. And on the other side, the miracle of this technology is that it can detect uh, the disease outside a building. It can, it can protect people. It can gather data. It can do all kinds of marvelous, unprecedented things, which may contribute to the termination, uh, or at least buying time until a vaccination occurs. But you live right in the middle of this world. Did you also feel this kind of changing of climate unfolding? Uh, y yes, I did. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's been that's always fascinating, and I think it's one of these challenges where we have to hold both things, two ideas at the same time. I think on the one hand, the promise and possibilities of technology continue to be enormous. Uh, the transformation potential of how these technologies, information technologies especially, can transform society, transform lives in, a, in very positive ways, I think remains true. And it also remains true that many of these technologies for the benefits to be fully realized have to operate at scale. Uh, I think it wouldn't be helpful to have, uh, you know, 100,000 search engines or 100,000 social platforms. In some ways, it almost defeats the purpose uh, because these become valuable when they uh, uh, you know, agglomerate many participants, and, and that's why platforms are useful. So you have all these benefits that come from the technological innovation, the scale, uh, the speed, uh, and the marginal cost economics that come from increasing scale, which are all wonderful. And we also have the benefits that come from the fact that these technologies allow us to do some innovations that would be very, very hard. I think in this COVID moment, we've seen everything from technology be used for contact tracing. We've also seen AI-based techniques and machine learning techniques uh, join up with uh, the, you know, the innovations in the biological sciences to begin to simulate what potential vaccines might look like, the use of machine learning uh, in you know, uh, trying to think through the, understand the disease itself. So these are all wonderful things and we should absolutely capitalize and harness this as much as possible. But at the same time, uh, you know, with all these enormous benefits, uh, come enormous challenges and responsibilities. Uh, this is particularly the case when it comes to things like the potential use and misuse of these technologies. We know that machine learning and AI and so forth can be so subject to bias, uh, can be so can be misused uh, in ways that lead to whether it's deep fakes or you know fake news or uh, mimicking this that or the other. These are all misuses of technology. We also know that they can be used for, uh, you know, by authoritarian regimes for monitoring society. So, but so the fact that we have these both these enormous benefits, uh, but yet these enormous challenges, to me, just suggests that we should be thinking about how do we manage the use of these technologies, what governance mechanisms do we have? I think it's it, it's it'd be a mistake in my view, Rob, to you know, to be on one or either side of these. And, you know, so the, the view that says we should therefore stop using technologies doesn't seem to make sense to me. At the same time, the view that says we should let technology do what technology will do and not manage it in any way also doesn't make sense to me. So I think one of the challenges of the 21st century, I think, is going to be how do we think about governance mechanisms uh, for the use of these technologies? Uh, that allow us to get all these enormous benefits, but at the same time helps us mitigate all these enormous downsides. I think that is yet 
still an unsolved challenges. And I worry that we're going to veer back and forth between two extremes here in a way that won't be helpful uh, to society. Yeah, I know your uh, fellow commissioner, Ro Hinton Medora, that runs the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, I both I heard him at a meeting of the Vatican Council uh, on social science and also uh, in a podcast that we made together. And he's advocating for something analogous to the Food and Drug Administration, where instead of technology going out and finding out what it does to society, we run pilot programs like you do in pharmaceuticals or new food products, assure their, what you might call safety and the kind of, what you might call their implications for society, and then authorize them. I don't know, uh, that requires a very deep and knowledgeable understanding by the evaluators. And in this tech environment, uh, I suppose it's feasible, just like understanding deep effects in biology and chemistry. But do you think, do you think such a notion makes, uh, has a modicum of sense within it? Uh, I, I, th I think it does. Uh, and I think we're going to need, you know, methods like that, running pilots and experiments, but also uh, very adaptive policymaking. Uh, and I think the, uh, I've always liked the idea of adaptive policymaking because I think historically we've always assumed that, you know, policymakers can think through all the possible consequences and come up with the perfect uh, uh, solution and the perfect policy that anticipates all possibilities. I think that's very hard to do with rapidly advancing science and technology. Uh, so there's got to be some notion also of adaptive uh, and evolving policies and, and methods for how we govern these things that try to at least keep up uh, with these technologies as they, as they evolve both in their capabilities and their possible impacts. But I think that can be coupled with... Uh, you know, pilots and experiments, a bit like the Food and Drug Administration. The, the, the only thing I would, I would want to think about, though, Rob, is that when it comes to powerful foundational technologies like artificial intelligence and some of these biological or biology-based uh, synthetic biology innovations, is to keep in mind that we, may, in some cases, we may not have the luxury of undoing their effect. Uh, because I think, you know, once you start to do things at the uh, uh, genome level and start to do uh, genetic editing, those things may not be possible to undo uh, and say, where you can say, oops, uh, that was a bad idea. Let's not do that again. Uh, so I think more forward looking thinking is actually quite important and not and not only rely on the fact that we should just let things happen and we'll iterate our way to the right answer. We may not have the luxury in all cases to do that, particularly with these powerful foundational technologies. Well, speaking of looking forward, you do a tremendous amount that, how would I say, uh, explores, envisions what we call the future of work. I had a very extraordinary experience at the Swedish consulate in the United States uh, about uh, February of 2019, just after Peter Goodman, the New York Times reporter in London, had written a story called We Love the Robots. And these Swedes came to me. Leif Pogratsky was the head of the consulate. He's a good friend of mine. And at the time they said, Mr. Johnson, you've always had a growth model in economics. And the story was the U.S. is flexible, reallocates, and continues to grow, and Europe is sclerotic. But we think the scope and the scale of technical change now is so frightening and so threatening that the Scandinavian model, where we protect people but not jobs, will allow us to take advantage of the production possibility frontier where America may be caught in despondency, despair, and uh, a very, very sick form of adversarial politics and that uh, our governance had to start thinking about governing for people rather than governing for sectors or what have you. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, your knowledge, your insight, your sensitivity 
to the future of work. What do you see on the horizon? How, how is technology in this? Well, I feel like we're kind of in the middle of the game. We're in baseball terms in the fourth inning. How does the rest of the game look like it will play out in your mind? And, and do the Swedes have a valid perspective on how what you might call fear might overcome opportunity and, and we'll miss significant opportunities if we don't adjust how governance and society react to it? Uh, I, th I think the Swedes may be onto something uh, here, but keep in mind that you know, what, what they're describing was essentially one of the key insights from the Lyndon Johnson Commission. Uh, as you remember, Rob, Lyndon Johnson uh, uh, set up one of the earliest commissions on the future of work, what we would call today the future of work. Uh, this is a blue ribbon commission that included some future greats, people like Bob Solo, for example, uh, were on that commission. And one of the key insights from that commission, when they finally published their report in the late 60s, was to make an observation, which I think is still true, which is technology destroys jobs, but not work. And I think that's still true uh, in the sense that, you know, all the research we've done and even that of others, I think would suggest that uh, there will probably always be demand for work. Uh, and part of it is how society and the economy adjusts to the changing nature of work along the way. So for example, part of what our research has shown when we've looked at this question of uh, future work, in fact, we published a report that we called Jobs Lost, Jobs Gained. Uh, and we titled it that way quite deliberately because uh, we did find that there would be jobs that would be lost, uh, but at the same time, there'd be jobs that would be gained. And in most of the economies that we looked at, uh, the data and the analysis and the scenarios seem to suggest that, uh, you know, the net of it would be that there'd be more jobs gained than lost. And so in that sense, at least, if you look at the next several decades, I'm not as worried about a net loss of jobs because of technology and automation. Uh, of course, one should always worry about it, that at some level in, in the most extreme scenarios, but I'm not, that's not my biggest uh, worry or thing to think about when it comes to future of work. What I do think about are some of the transitions along the way as the economy and the nature and structure of jobs evolve. And here there are basically four key transitions that I think about. One is the transitions uh, around skills and, and how the skills needed to for the jobs that emerge and evolve need to adapt and shift. Uh, we know that what happens with technology is uh, yes, some jobs get lost, but also many more jobs actually change. So both for the people who work in jobs that have been lost and for those workers who work in jobs that are changing because of technology, the one common feature of both kinds of changes is the need to reskill or build new skills that allow them either to be employed in the jobs that are emerging or adapt as their own jobs change because of technology. So this question of skill ad skills adaptation and skill shifts is an important consideration. A second one is to think about the occupational shifts themselves. We know that anytime technology has an effect, and this has been true since, you know, the industrial revolution. I mean, we forget that, you know, there was a time when half the workers in America worked in agriculture. Today, only under 2% work in agriculture. That's an example of occupational shifts that have occurred in the economy. So one of the things we know is that there are going to be these occupational shifts and how workers adapt and how society or even government and other mechanisms make it easy for workers to adapt and shift occupations as occupations grow, I think is an important uh, second shift to think about and manage. The third one, in some ways, maybe one of the toughest ones, actually, which is how we adapt with regards to wages and incomes. Uh, we know that one of the things that is that shifts as occupations shift, we know that most occupations are shifting to more service sector jobs. And on the for the for the most part, service sector jobs don't pay as much as 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 some of the jobs that are categories that are actually declining. So this shift in occupations and sectors 
has a mostly a downdraft impact on wages uh, for most workers. Uh, you know, we know that, for example, we're going to need more care workers. And by the way, the need for care workers has only been exacerbated in this current COVID moment because of the need for to care, not just for workers as, as society ages, but to care for workers when they're public health crisis. But we also know that most people involved in the care sector don't get paid as much as they should. We all say we value teachers uh, and, 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 and roles like that. Those are some of the hardest jobs to automate. But at the same time, you know, we don't really pay teachers as well as perhaps we should. Uh, we don't pay people who look after our children as much as we should. So this question of the wage effects as occupations shift and the structure of the economy shifts in this future work is one of the most difficult ones for us to contemplate. And then the final one, the fourth kind of big challenge is, of course, how we redesign work itself. We know that we, we've always needed to redesign work and workflows, uh, but now think about how we also having to redesign work because of the public health crisis. We're now having to think about, uh, you know, social distancing in the workplace. Uh, how do we think about protocols for reopening the economy? How do we think about protocols that keep workers safe and healthy? Uh, and what happens when in fact we, the pandemic lingers or we have many more pandemics in the future. So we're now having to recontemplate this question of how do we actually organize for work, both to take account of technology effect, but also now public health crisis and public health considerations. So to me, these are some of the big things to think about. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you know, I happen to be co-chairing the Future Work Commission uh, in California. And California is, you know, the fifth largest economy in the world, if it was a country. And these are very profound challenges, actually. Let me mention one other challenge, by the way, which uh, is a fifth challenge when it comes to work. Uh, this is the fact that uh, we now have an interesting geography of work, uh, which we now have to contemplate. And this comes in stark relief. I mean, even before the COVID crisis, Rob, uh, you know, if you had looked at the national statistics, we would say, hey, there's job growth in the United States, there's job growth everywhere. But some of the work we've done where we've been trying to look at the job labor markets at the county level. Uh, so, for example, we looked at, uh, you know, all the counties in the United States, right, which is roughly something like 3,150 counties. And when you look at the labor markets at that granular county level, you suddenly realize that even though the national numbers say we've had job growth, those jobs have been very concentrated in a few places and not everywhere. Uh, and you see the same patterns in Europe where we've just done work similarly looking at uh, local economies across a few countries in Europe. You suddenly realize that you have this geography of work where we now have to deal with the fact that work looks very uneven from place to place. And this is the other challenge of the 21st century, by the way, this geography of work, in addition to some of these uh, inequality challenges. So I think when I think about the future of work, it's, it's less about are we going to have jobs in the future? I think we will, but it's much more how do we deal with these four or five challenges uh, I've just described? I think that's the work we have to do to solve for that. Hmm. So, James, uh, as we uh, look at our commission, we're convened in probably another month uh, electronically, but the co-chairs are putting together kind of a what I'll call not, not a reset, but a adjustment to course. And as I talk to you and the other commissioners through this podcast, I'm curious how you think things have changed as a role result of the pandemic and what's been revealed say since since december we were on our way to write four key reports you and uh, mike spence were the co-chairs of the subcommittee on technology and I'm, I'm very grateful that you are given the kind of insights that you could share today but over the large scheme of things four we've got four reports on financialization uh one on how the nation state is being affected by globalization, uh, climate, technology, and then 
as we've talked about on the horizon, the induced disruption of those other four and how they create uh, problems uh, that lead to migration. But I, as, as you look at it now, what would you advise us as, as our co-architect to do? How should we change our course in understanding and in exploring and hopefully guiding the world to a better place? I think um, some of what we were planning to do feels like it's still right to focus on, but perhaps with, the, with greater emphasis. So, for example, I think thinking through the impact of technology on society still feels the right thing to me, I think, because this moment has probably accelerated those technological trends. If they were going at a fast clip, I think, you know, we've now lived through a moment where the whole world has had this experiment about working from home. Uh, we've had this experiment about e-commerce and how it plays out. We now we've had this experiment about what does, you know, remote learning look like. So I think these technological trends have become even more important to fully understand. Uh, for, so, I, so that, I think, is still important. I also think that the questions that we were grappling with around globalization itself uh, and whether we call you know, the different global flows that happen, whether it's the flow of goods, products, and services, how value chains work, how what the people flows, migration, as you mentioned, I think the flow of things are in, through, through the global economy, I think is going to go through a re-examination, I think, uh, both because of some of the economic implications, but also even the public health uh, implications on, on, our, on a topic that perhaps we should have spent some time on, which is the evolution of global value chains. So I think that seems to me to be important, perhaps more than we may have considered before. I think there's a final area that I think is going to be so become so important for us as a commission, uh, Rob, which is you know, I think we're going through a, a massive reconsideration of several things where I think we're going to have to reconsider how does our, our system work, uh, uh, whether it's a capitalist system or economic system more broadly defined. How does it work and what is the role of institutions where institutions are either governments or companies in supporting individuals? I think there's an interesting moment here to reconsider how the system works in a fundamental way. I think this crisis is a unique opportunity. I've just been struck, Rob, by the fact that for the first time I've heard people openly and quite comfortably talking about safety nets, talking about should we now take seriously universal basic income? Should we take seriously the question of uh, health for all? Uh, should we, you know, and universalizing healthcare in some form or fashion? I think this is an, a unique moment to reconsider these things. And then finally, I think it's worth reconsidering here, what are the things that we have to tackle globally in some coordinated fashion? I think pandemics and perhaps climate change are two that come to mind, where these are, these are, these are challenges that are gonna need our collective action and to a large extent, some global coordination because these don't constrain themselves uh, via national borders necessarily, but I think we've now come to realize how global coordination is important. I've just been heartened, by the way, in this pandemic moment by the enormous amount of collective and coordinated scientific research uh, that's going on right now. I think the scientists right now are showing the way in many respects when it comes to global collaboration and coordination in a way that's quite inspiring, to be honest. So I'm quite excited about that. Yeah, the, the resurrection of faith and trust in expertise through the scientific explorations, uh, I think, is a very important, uh, I say, thing to underscore, just as you did, because the denigration of expertise in many forms has been... Uh, accelerating up until this point. Yes. Well, James, I, I think this has been an outstanding session. I want to thank you for joining me. I'm inspired and comforted to have you on the Global Commission and be a guiding light, particularly in the realms related to technology, but, but across many areas as the listeners today 
to now understand. I hope to see you again or hear you again in the uh, coming months. We can reconvene on this podcast and explore as, th as things develop. And uh, I look forward to reading and also uh, putting on the INET website many of the documents that you and the McKinsey Global Institute are creating to share with us and shed light on the challenges we face. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Yeah. And, and thank you, Rob, for having me. This is wonderful. And, you know, I think more than ever, the work that we're doing on the commission, I think is, is you know, if we thought it was important, it's become even more important now, I think. I agree. I agree. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.